We're in the final month of our five months of purpose. And each one of those months, each and every one of those months, we've focused on the five purpose statements of the church and illustrated how those purposes help us to accomplish God's will. I want to give you a little test right at the beginning of this message. Let's see if we can if we can name those five purposes. Are you all ready up for a little challenge, a little test? Let's see if we can name those five purposes. Here we go. What, what's the first one? Anybody know what the first one is? Honor. Honor. Is it up there? Honor. There we go. Let's see if we can get a little bit better. Now, we've been preaching on this for five months. Come on now. Honor. The second one is? Reach. reach. There we go. All right. Reach. Honor. Let's say it together. Honor. Reach. Okay, now let's, we got honor, reach. What's the third one? Equip. I heard it out there. Honor, reach, say it together. Equip. All right, honor, reach, equip. What's the fourth one? Share. Hey, we're getting rolling here. Honor, reach, equip. What's it? Share. Okay, and then the final one today is? Oh, there we go. So let's say it together. Honor, reach, equip, share, Serve. So this month we're focusing on serving Christ, serving others. Serving Christ, serving others. And today I want to show you how they integrate together. How serving Christ and serving others fits together. Because when we're serving others, we're really serving Christ. And I want to show you in God's word how that works. When we're serving others, we're really serving the Lord Jesus Christ. See, body ministry is service to the Lord. Body ministry is service to the Lord. In Matthew chapter 24, that's the chapter right before the one I asked you to turn to in Matthew 25. But in, in Matthew chapter 24, the disciples asked Jesus a question. They asked him about end time events. They said, Lord, what's it going to be like in the end times? And what about your returning? And so they asked him about those end time events and about his return. And so Jesus paints a picture for them of the end time events. We've been having such a great time on Wednesday nights as we've been studying the book of Revelation and going deep into that book and everything that it means, not only because Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ, and it's not only what's going to happen after the rapture takes place. I know there's a number of believers that say, well, why bother with the book of Revelation? I'm not going to be here. But there is so much in the book of Revelation that shows us about how we're to live now, how we're to process things now. And so we're looking into that uh, on Wednesday nights and Jesus sat down with his disciples and in just one chapter in the book of Matthew, he begins to explain to them, paint a picture for them about what it's going to be like in the end days. And then he begins to teach them what they need to know to be ready for his return. When's Jesus going to come? Think about it. When is Jesus going to come? Soon, isn't it? The scripture tells us he's going to come at a time when we least expect it. And so he begins to share with them what they need to know to be ready for that day, that moment. Uh, Thessalonians says the twinkling of an eye when Jesus returns for his bride. And the first thing he does is he uses the parable of the ten virgins. He, he, he begins to tell them a story as he's painted the picture of end times event. He begins to paint a picture through a parable of the ten virgins and he lets them know through that parable that they must be both wise and vigilant as they watch for his return. After the parable of the ten virgin, he takes them into another parable. He uses the parable of the talents. And with that parable of the talents, he teaches them to be ready means to use their gifts to produce a harvest. And so we see through these parables that Jesus told them to be ready, to be ready for his return by keeping their focus on God. Amen? Amen. Be ready by keeping your focus on God. And then also to be ready for Jesus' return by producing a harvest and winning the lost to salvation. How many of y'all know in these last days, winning the lost to salvation is so key? But he doesn't stop there. The next thing he teaches is to be ready for his return by serving him through serving others. 
to be ready for his return, we need to be serving him through serving others. I want you to follow along with me. Matthew chapter 25, look there at verse 31. Matthew chapter 25, beginning at verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Then the king, then the king will say to those on his right hand, come you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Here comes an explanation. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer. The righteous will answer, and answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in? Or naked and clothe you? Or when do we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king, the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in naked and you did not clothe me sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of these, the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, as we look at that passage of scripture, Jesus is giving a glimpse into the throne room. We need to understand this is not a parable. The ten virgins was a parable. The talents was a parable. But here Jesus is giving us a glimpse into the throne room. Jesus introduces this teaching with this statement. When the Son of Man, who's the Son of Man? Jesus himself. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will set on his throne of glory. When Jesus comes again, when he sets up his throne of judgment in the end and the last days, he's giving us a glimpse into this throne room. See, therefore, the king in verse 34, it says the king in verse 34, that's not a character Jesus is using for an illustration, but it's Jesus himself. And who is Jesus? Jesus is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So you and I, are getting a glimpse into the supernatural. You and I are getting a glimpse into the future. You and I are getting to see the King of kings and the Lord of lords setting on his throne in the judgment. That also means it's not a story but a glimpse into the future. And so we see that in his judgment, Jesus divides the nations. We get a glimpse into what's really going to take place. It's not a story. And in that, in that glimpse, into that, that insight, in his judgment, Jesus divides the nations. Look at verse 32. All the nations will be gathered before him. You know, there won't be anybody saying, well, I'll take a pass. I'm going to bow out of this one. I'll catch the next meeting. It says what? All the nations... All, let me give you the deep theological meaning of the word all. Are you ready? All in the ancient Greek means all. <laughs> Everybody. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another. Listen, as a shepherd. Now this is key. He's going to separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Here we go. All the once great nations of the earth will stand before the king of all creation. 
Doesn't matter whether they accepted him. Doesn't matter whether they believed in him. Doesn't matter whether they believed in the Big Bang Theory. Doesn't matter if they believed we came from apes or God created us and put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. It doesn't matter what a person's belief system is. Truth is truth. Can I get an amen this morning? Some of y'all have heard me use this illustration before. A number of years ago, there was a bumper sticker that was around and Christians were using it and just thought it was great. It said, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. I thought that was really cool until one day the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, doesn't matter whether you believe it or not, God said it, that settles it. Amen? God said it, that settles it. And so we find here that all these great nations are gonna stand before the king, the creator of all creation. But Jesus will not divide the nations. Jesus is gonna divide the people. See, this is not gonna be a judgment about what the nations have done. I want you to think about that. Whenever it says all the nations, it's talking about all the people, all the tribes, all the tongues. Everybody's going to be there, but it's not going to be about national boundaries. It's not going to be about what this nation did and what that nation did and what this nation didn't do and what that nation didn't do. It's not going to be about any of that, but Jesus will not divide the nations. He will divide the people. The scripture says clearly he will separate one from another as a shepherd Shepherd doesn't separate flocks. Shepherds separate the sheep. And the shepherd knows you by name. Amen. And so on this judgment, Jesus is dealing with people. It's time for each individual to stand alone before the throne of God. As we continue this glimpse into the throne room, Jesus lets us know that he'll divide the people into two categories. Really, there's only two types of people in the world, although there's all kind of personalities and all kind of giftings. There's only really two people. There are those that belong to the Lord and those who do not belong to the Lord. And so the first category are those that are his. And they're the sheep. And where does he place them? He places them on his right hand. Now we see that throughout scripture, sheep are used to symbolize the children of God. Through the Old Testament and the New Testament, whenever they describe sheep, they, they use that analogy, that symbolism to describe the people of God. I heard a minister one time said, but yeah, sheep bite. Yeah, sheep do bite. But he places those on his right hand. And what does the right hand mean? Well, the right hand is powerful symbolism because the right hand means, uh, that symbolizes God's favor, symbolizes God's provision, symbolizes God's protection, symbolizes God's power, amen? The right hand of power. And so those that are his, the sheep, are placed in, in the position of God's provision, God's protection, God's power. But what about the other side, the second category, those who are not his? the goats. He places them on the left-hand side. Just the opposite of the sheep, the goats, symbolize those who mix in with the sheep but are not really God's children. Did you hear that? Those who mix in with the sheep but they're really not God's children. You know, a little known fact because we're so used to uh, the European culture and that coming to the United States but the Palestinian sheep, particularly in Jesus' day and even much of it today, the sheep aren't white. How many of y'all, whenever you think of a sheep, you either think of a white sheep or a black sheep? Most of the time of a white sheep. I remember those Serta Perfect Sleeper commercials, <laughs> counting the sheep, right? Well, the sheep weren't white. And so as this illustration is, the goat and the sheep would roam together in the herd. And it wasn't until the shepherd began separating the sheep from the goats that she could really tell the difference because the goats didn't have these big old horns. And so looking at the flock, it was hard to tell. But the shepherd knew every one of those that were his sheep and those that were the goats. And so the shepherd is going to be separating the sheep from the goat. He's going to put the goats on the left hand. And what does the left hand symbolize? The the disfavor of God. Here we got the provision, the protection, the power of God. Here we have the disfavor of God. Jesus is teaching that he knows his children are. He knows who his children are and there's coming a day when he'll divide those who are his children from those who are not his children. And here's a very key thought as we've looked into the throne room. 
If, as we've looked at the fact that Jesus is going to judge and set up that judgment to divide the nations, but really divide the people. Here's a key. Serving the body of Christ will determine who belongs to the Lord. Now, there are a lot of factors involved in this, and sometimes we try to make it real simple for us to understand, but how many of you all know that God, his ways are far above our ways? Even the scripture says past understanding, but yet God wants us to know. He wants us to understand. So we're going to try to simplify today, and anybody that's sitting there saying, well, that's not the only thing you need to have to go to heaven, Pastor Hensel understands that. But I don't want to shortchange this because God took this whole segment to teach this one specific truth and therefore he is putting great weight and great force on it. Serving the body of Christ will determine who belongs to the Lord. Serving the body of Christ is serving the Lord. When we serve the body of Christ, we serve the Lord. Look back at verse 37 with me. Verse 37. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When would we see you as a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? Now, before I read verse 40 again, I want to pause there because that's the natural response of those who have the heart of God. I didn't realize I was ministering to you, Lord. I was just helping this person out. The Holy Spirit laid this individual on my heart and I just did what God told me to do. I, I gave him that extra $10 that I had because you, you said to do that. I, I stopped at the grocery store and picked up a few groceries and dropped it by that single mother's house. I, I, I took a couple extra moments out of my day and when I could tell the cash register, the cashier wasn't doing well, I, I just took a few moments and spoke some words of encouragement to her. I prayed with my waiter or my waitress. I, I didn't know that I was serving you. I, I, I went to the prison, right Donna? I went to the prison, Sister Donna, and and, and I, I didn't really realize I was serving you, but Lord, my heart was there for those women who were inmates and the situation in their life that got them to where they are now. And I, I know there's so much more for them, Lord. When did I do these things to serve you, to minister to you? In verse 40, and the king. Think about it, folks. Standing before the king of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ himself. And the king will answer and say to them, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar. As a matter of fact, every now and then, I just throw in a couple of words to just impress some of our English teachers here, you know, because, you know, I ain't got any better sense, you know. And God just gets gooder and gooder every day. But you know, as I look at this passage of scripture, it's important for us to apply some good grammatical understanding. Jesus says brethren there. You notice that? You see that? He says brethren there. As you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. And it's important for us to understand who is he calling brethren? Who is he speaking to? Who is he referring? Jesus, brethren, Jesus is referring to are those being served. He's not necessarily expressing it to those who are doing the serving, although they would be included, but he's specifically here using that designation for those that are being served. Those that are being served are Jesus' brethren. They're a part of his family. Therefore, Jesus is speaking of brothers serving brothers, believers serving believers. The body of Christ ministering to the body of Christ. Now, once again, I understand we're supposed to minister to the lost. It doesn't take anything away from our outreach to others. If you notice, we're having another outreach actually to this month, one that we're doing as a church and the other one we're joining with the community to do. And then there's regular things that we do on a weekly basis to minister to folks, including the food pantry every Tuesday morning right after the hour of power. And I'm putting in a commercial here. Pastor Chris, you did a great job. Hour of power from 9 to 10. Food pantry is from 
11 to 1.30 on every Tuesday. I'd like our food pantry team to just wave at Pastor this morning. Let's show our appreciation for these folks. Now, Spring, did you wave? See, because you're part of the food pantry team. She's not here on Tuesdays, but her and Krista and some others pick up the food every, well, it used to be every Friday. Now it's kind of, we're not sure when it's coming in. But as we look at that, we see powerfully that Jesus is talking about the body of Christ serving the body of Christ. Brothers serving brothers, sisters serving sisters. Jesus is declaring that when you serve even the least in the body of Christ, you're serving him. You're serving him. I need to explain that. I need to kind of break that down a little bit. I need to unpack that a little bit. And I want to start out by saying, God is love. I love saying that. God is is love. God is the source of love. The only way love exists in this world is because God is love and from him radiates love. Now we can know that in our mind. We can say it over and over again. Say it with me this morning. God is love. Ready? God is love. We can say that over and over again until one day this thing happens in our spirit. And we begin to get a deeper, more profound understanding of what that means when we understand that God is love. See, it's more than a feeling. It's more than an expression. It's more than a thought. It's a being. God is a being, a person, and that being or person is God. So therefore, when we have true, unpolluted love in our hearts and our lives, that's God, because God is love. And whenever that begins to break forth in our mind, when we begin to unpack that, when we begin to understand that in our spirit, then something begins to happen in us that we never knew could happen, that we never could understand before, because we begin to get the revelation that God is love. Let me take it one step further. Genuine service flows out of genuine love. Genuine service flows out of genuine love. See, when you love someone, it brings you joy to serve them. Now, I'm going to still be preaching here, but some of you all are going to think I've gone to meddling, but this is still preaching here. It's good preaching, too, just in case you don't catch that. See, when you truly love someone, it brings you joy to serve them. Young man, young woman, if you really love your mom and dad, it brings you joy to serve them. Can I get an amen this morning? It's not a task. It's not a burden. It's not stealing of your time. If you truly love your parents, then it's a joy to serve them. Adult children, some of you are caregivers. You know... Well, no, I won't go there. I won't say that. But I will say this. It can be a real challenge serving your parents in the latter days of their life. I'm looking at some of you all here, and I know you know exactly what pastor's talking about. But why? You love them. You don't always like what they're doing, but you love them. Amen? And it, it gives you joy in your heart, even in the difficult times. Why? Because you love them. Husbands, wives, you knew I was going there, didn't you? It's a joy. Husbands, it's a joy to serve your wife. Wives, it's a joy. It's not a task. It's not demeaning. It's a joy to serve your husband. Why? Because you love them. I'm going to get myself in trouble, but it's just okay. I, I, that's why the Lord called me up here, just to get myself in trouble every now and then. I know when I'm about to say this, there's some ladies in this church that are just going to get, well, I can't believe. But you know, on most nights, Sister Fran makes my plate for me. She puts the food on my dinner plate for me. Well, don't you got two arms? Can't you do it yourself? Oh, yeah. But do you know when Sister Fran does that? You know what she's saying to me? And what I hear real loud and clear, I love you. I love you. And I love her for that. 
Now, last night it was different. She said, you can fix your plate. <laughs> and that didn't change anything. I knew she still loved me, amen? As a matter of fact, I kind of appreciated it because we were having spaghetti last night and I got to put all the spaghetti and sauce on my plate I wanted to. <laughs> Praise you, Jesus. But when we truly love, genuine, genuine service flows out of genuine love. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, just as the Son of Man, who's the Son of Man? Say it with me, Jesus. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Just as God himself came down to this earth not to be served, the one who has all authority and deserves all honor and respect and praise and worship and service, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Romans chapter 5 verse 8, but God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were still wretched, lowly sinners. Oh, I added those words. Christ died for us. Wow. Why did he do that? Because God is love. And out of genuine love flows genuine service. See, serving those whom God loves demonstrates that we belong to him. When we, you and I, when we serve our brothers and sisters in Christ, those are those that God loves. And somebody would say, well, he loves the world. Yes, he loves the world. Jesus came that no one should have to perish, but that all could have everlasting life. But you better know that God, that you have a special place in God's heart as a son or daughter of God, amen? So serving those whom God loves demonstrates that we belong to him. See, we belong to him because we love him and we've accepted the free gift of salvation, amen? That's the first step to belonging to God is accepting that gift. Jesus died for us and so we need to confess our sins and if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We belong to him because we love his children. You know when Pastor Hensel stands up here and says, I love you? That's not just a preacher talk. I love you. Now I'm going to get in trouble again. Thank you, Sarah. Some of y'all have given me a fit over the years. <laughs> but I love you. I truly do. See, because I've given Sister Fran a fit over the years, and she still loves me. I've given the Heavenly Father, are you with me on this one? You and I, we've given the Heavenly Father a big fit over the years, and guess what? He still loves us. We belong to him because we love his children. We belong to him because out of that love, we serve each other. 1 John chapter 4, verse 12 says, no one has ever seen God at any time. If we love one another, if we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. Wow. Let me take us back to our text. I kind of gave the, the context. I kind of unpacked it. Let's go back and look at it once again through fresh spiritual eyes. Verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father. Jesus talking about God the Father, our good, good father. Come, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, assuredly, I say to you, Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. You did it to me. 
You know, sometimes the things that we do for others seems to be unappreciated. Very little recognition. But I want you to know, Jesus said, if you give a cup of water, if you give a cup of water, everything's being recorded in heaven. For those of us who know Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, there's absolutely nothing that we do for others in the kingdom of God that doesn't go uh, noticed. God cares for us. He cares for everything that we're doing and he takes it personally. Whenever you smiled at that person this morning and shook their hand and said, welcome to the father's house, God took that personal. There's my son, there's my daughter welcoming another child of mine to the house of God, making them feel welcome. What you didn't know maybe was that person really had a difficult week this week faced some challenges and whenever you smiled at them, warmly shook that hand, they, they, they began to feel hope in their heart. Maybe, just maybe this next week's going to be a better week. God pays attention to all that. See, the enemy wants to keep us focused on ourselves and not allow the love of God to grow in our hearts for others. But Jesus said the true test of whether we are his children or not is how we serve others. That's the true test. No matter how long you pray, no matter how many chapters of the Bible you read, doesn't matter whether you have the latest worship CD and it plays in your house all day long. What matters is if you're a son or daughter of God, are you serving others in the body of Christ? Amen. And so here's a question. Jesus sees people for who they are. Jesus sees people for who they are and loves them anyway. So here's the question. Do you have a servant's heart? Do you have a servant's heart? Maybe you do. You just want it to increase, amen? I got a servant's heart. I just want more of the love of the Lord in me. I, I want the Lord to teach me how to serve more. At this point, don't let the enemy beat you up. Come on, this ain't about the enemy beating you up. Because right now, the enemy will bring to your mind, he'll say to you, remember that person that you were supposed to talk to and you didn't talk to them? And then he'll fix your mind on that. But that's what not God's talking about this morning. He says, if you want a servant's heart, if you want that heart to increase, I'll give you that increase. What if I don't have a servant's heart? I'm, I'm in the service this morning and I just know I don't have a servant's heart. That's okay. God's got you covered. It's not okay to not have a servant's heart. It's okay because God's got you covered. All you have to do is turn it over to him and he'll begin growing and developing that servant's heart in you. Amen? Praise God. Praise God. Do you have a servant's heart, but you're not sure how to express it? You're not quite sure how to express that servant's heart that God's given you because in today's society, you have to be very careful you don't offend somebody. Everybody's suspicious today. God's got you covered on that as well because he'll show you ways to express that servant's heart and he'll have you begin to do it right here in the body of Christ, right where it's safe. Well, kind of safe. The people who do love you, amen. Jesus will guide you in the ways to serve his body. Do you want to serve the Lord by serving his body? How many of y'all want to do that? If you want to serve the Lord by serving his body, is that your heart's desire this morning? I want to serve the Lord by serving his body. Well, we've got tables set up in the foyer where you can sign up. No, pastor's just kidding. How about we just start right here, right now? Let's just do a little serving the body of Christ laboratory right here at the end of this church service. Pastor, what are you talking about? Everybody in this place is real. Dwayne, good to see you today. Amen. Is mom doing okay? Praise God. Amen. Everybody in this place is real today. Anthony, how you doing today? Much better today? Praise God. See, we don't always know all the challenges that are going on, but God knows the challenges. Amen. We don't have to know everything that's going on in everybody's life, but we do have to have a love and a care for our brothers and sisters in Christ. So this is what we're going to do. If we have a desire to minister to the Lord by ministering to his body, 
I'm going to ask you all in just a moment to get out of your chairs and step out into the aisles and gather with just three or four people. Not 10 or 15, just three or four. Three or four, three or four. The reason why I say three or four because you'll have opportunity to hear everybody and pray for everybody. And I'm not going to just say two because I don't want you and your wife getting together, although that's great. I want you getting with somebody you didn't ride to church with today, man. Just three or four together. And then I want you to do this simple thing. Now, please, everybody listen to pastor here because we can take as long as the Holy Spirit wants as long as it's the Holy Spirit. I want everybody in that group of three or four to give one thing that you want everybody else in that group to pray for you about. Now, they don't need to know about your mother's second cousin that was related to your brother's sister who, you know, and, and that this has, you know, been in your family for all these years, naming everybody that's had to deal with it. All they need to know is just the thing. Amen. And just share that one thing and then earnestly, seriously pray for each other. But it starts here. Then I ask you to keep praying for those people and for those needs after you leave the house, amen. Prayer is where body ministry begins. The only way anything good happens is if it's bathed in prayer first and out of that prayer comes action. Out of that prayer comes response. Out of that prayer comes God's provision. Out of that prayer comes God's anointing. Out of that prayer comes God's grace. So I've given you a little bit of a chance to process this and think about it. So I'd like everybody to stand to your feet this morning. As you stand to your feet, this isn't going to sound real spiritual, but it'll, it'll just be a good way to get it started. When I count to three, I want everybody moving to somebody else. Amen. Find that group of three or four. Praise God. And then do that. Mention one thing and then begin praying. Amen. Here you go. One, two, three. Find somebody you're going to pray with this morning. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God.